welcome. This is a special breakdown for mastering structure. We're going to break down the structure of the movie Prey, which is now on Hulu. It is the newest entry to the Predator franchise. My name is Tom Vaughn. I have been writing screenplays professionally for about 25 years now. I have also been teaching screenwriting for about 20 years now. And basically what that means is I've spent a great deal of time figuring out different ways to simplify this process and to teach it to others. So one of the reasons why I like to break down structure is one, it's a lot of how I learned screenwriting. I started out as an actor and a playwright. And when I decided to kind of transition to screenwriting, the way I dug deeply into it was structure. I knew how to write scenes. I felt comfortable in that area. What I did not understand was story structure. So I would just break down as many scripts as I could and look at this minute this happens and this minute this happens and this minute this happens. And what I learned from it are two crucial things. Like I certainly identified like these sort of things tend to happen here and happen here. Now in the last 25 years, my knowledge of that has advanced and now I know why this happens and why this happens, like what the goal is of all these things. But I think more than anything for younger screenwriters trying to understand story, the biggest advantage to breaking down structures is to see how simple structures actually are. When we watch movies, we tend to think plot is more complicated and then story is more complicated. But when we break down structure and we actually see the sequences one after the other, we actually see how simple it is. And when we see how simple it is, we can derive confidence from that, that we can do this ourselves. So I'm going to create a lot of these videos of just kind of taking some of our favorite movies or movies that people are talking about, whatever it is, and breaking down the structure. And we can see. Now, I teach in a more advanced form of structure. And we start talking about like eight sequences along the four acts. But for these videos to kind of keep it simple, we'll just stick to the four acts and the major plot points within that. Now, if you look below, you should be able to click on a PDF and that PDF, you can download a minute by minute breakdown of Prey and that will kind of help you follow along for this conversation. Basically, that sheet is how I initially break down a movie. So just my advice, if you ever want to break down a movie, first watch the movie, enjoy it, be engaged, have fun with the movie. And then the second time you watch the movie, get out this sheet, pad a paper, whatever it is, and just start taking notes of this scene happens at this event, this scene happens at this event. Don't try to figure out act one at this point. Don't try to figure out the midpoint at this point. Just write down all the scenes. And when you have the entire list down and the movie is over, then you can turn back to this sheet. You'll have a 30,000 foot view and you'll be able to kind of figure out what these steps are. All right, so let's get to it. Now, what you'll see here is kind of a diagram I use. I'm pretty sure it's the influence of Sid Field when I first started learning screenwriting 30 years ago. Kind of a left, right, beginning of the movie on the left, and then the end of the movie on the right. And as you can see, it's broken into eight different elements. So that is the big lines are the acts, act one, Act 2A, Act 2B, and Act 3. And then I also teach the eight sequences beneath with two sequences within each act and each sequence having a specific job within the structure. Now, the eight sequences are more advanced work, so in this video we're going to stick to the four acts. It's going to keep our job right now a little easier. So we'll start talking about Prey and Act 1 of Prey. And Pretty much what we establish in Act One of Prey is the protagonist, Naru, this young Native American, and she wants her kutamiya, which is basically her challenge as a hunter to hunt something that is hunting her so she can prove herself. And really no one in the village really believes in her. She's the only one who really believes in herself in regards to being a hunter. That's the basic big picture of Act One. Now, how do we actually establish this? Well, we establish it by seeing Nauru in homework and play. 
And at home, we see her talk to her mother, and her mother wants her to adhere to more traditional parts of the society. At work, she is basically stuck with these gender roles that she doesn't really like. You see her harvesting, pulling out, I think is a wild carrot out of the soil. And then the contrast, and this is always really important as you see these things contrasted, is when she gets a moment to herself, when she can choose to do what she wants to do, which is play, she gets good at the hatchet. She's really good with this hatchet. This shows where her real desire is. It. And also in Act 1, we want to establish relationships and Naru's relationships with her brother. It's competitive, but loving. He supports her, but he doesn't necessarily think she's a hunter. Her mother, Aruka, is very adamant about, you're good at all these things. Why do you want to do this thing that is restricted to the men of the tribe? And then Wasapi, which is a Comanche warrior, who absolutely feels like she has no business on the hunt, she has no business in the search for the wounded tribesmen, really looks down on her. And then, of course, her best friend, her dog. We've established these relationships, we've established her at home, work, and play. And then every act one needs the inciting incident. And the inciting incident for the protagonist is something that happens to the protagonist. It happens to them. It disrupts their normal, everyday, ordinary world. And in this case, for Nauru, the inciting incident is she sees evidence in the forest that there is something bigger and more dangerous than the lion. The rest of Act 1, after the inciting incident, is essentially, what do I do with this? This thing has happened. What do I do now? I refer to it as the what now sequence. Blake Snyder refers to it as the debate sequence, which is a, a great way to describe it because that's essentially what you're doing. And sometimes there's even literal debates of what do we do now? The inciting incident happens. And then the end of act one is the choice of what we're going to do about this problem, this disruptive event that has happened to the ordinary world. Now, for Nauru, her conclusion is she goes to her brother and says, this thing is out there. This thing is bigger and more dangerous, and we need to do something about it. And her brother, who's now the war chief, says we're not going to do anything. So she takes it upon herself to go hunt this stronger creature. And when she chooses to do that, when she sneaks off away from the village to take on this problem herself, we are ending Act 1. The inciting incident happens to the protagonist, and the end of Act 1 is the decision the protagonist makes to deal with the inciting incident. Now, what's interesting about Prey, and why I find Prey a curious structure that really works, and really confident, is these details like this, that Act 1 is 29 minutes long. That's one-third of the movie. That is very long Act 1. And yet, there's no problem with emotional resonance. We are engaged in these characters. And there's no problem with narrative momentum because all through Act 1, it's been one want after another, keeping narrative momentum going forward. That all being said, a one-third of your story for Act 1 is kind of on the longer side. It's unusual, and yet it is you know, successful, I think. I had no issue whatsoever with being engaged in this story. So after Act 1, we go to Act 2A. And Act 2A has its own two sequences. Again, that's you know more advanced work. So we're just going to stick with the big Act 2A itself. Here she improves the hatchet. She puts a rope on it. She gets better at killing the rabbits. We intercut with the predator. And we can see this showdown coming. We are promising a showdown here. Then she finds the skinned buffalo, and that will come back. She falls into the quicksand, and that will come back. And then she comes across the bear. And then the bear, who is bigger and stronger than her, she witnesses the bear being killed by the predator. When she encounters the predator killing the bear, and she realizes that this big bad creature that she went out to fight is basically lifting up bears over its head, that she is not equipped to fight this thing. And she runs. That's our midpoint. 
And that's very clearly a defeat. And as I always talk about in the courses, that we want the midpoint to be a victory or a defeat. And the reason why we keep track of that is one, it's engaging from a narrative perspective, but it will make a decision for us later on when we are looking at the end of Act 2b. So far here, what we have is a, a fairly unbalanced structure, a 30-minute Act 1 and a 15-minute Act 2a. But again, it's working just fine. There's no issue here. All right, so after the midpoint, we go into Act 2b. And going along with our lack of balance, Act 2b is 34 minutes long. It's the longest act of the story. And it really can be broken down into the four sequences of Act 2b. The first sequence is the predator kills her tribesmen. She tells them there's something terrible out there. If they don't believe her, they beat her up. It's grueling to watch them beat her up. But then the predator comes. Great scene, killing her three fellow tribesmen. Then another sequence where she's captured and tied up by the French. And that's really tough to watch, to see her in a cage and helpless and they're poking at her. And then we see her brother being bled and tortured. And then the next sequence is the French try to capture the predator, and of course the predator kills them all. Great sequence of seeing the power of the predator and the arrogance of these Frenchmen, who we've already established we don't like for how they treated her, and then they're all killed. And then the fourth sequence, when Nauru returns to the French camp, she learns how to use a gun, and then the predator returns and actually ends up killing her brother. And at the midpoint on, this movie moves. The narrative momentum on this thing is quick. And this is a really good illustration of why, of seeing one clear sequence into another clear sequence into another clear sequence into another clear sequence. That is such an effective tool to push a script forward with incredible momentum. All right, so I want to talk about this particular part of the, the film, and normally what I refer to as sequence six. And again, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of sequences for you know, the purposes of this video, but this is normally what I would call the drive to the finish. And I am less interested in the academic part of structure in the sense of, hey, everything should be this way, it should be this way, it should be this way. The prescription part of it, I don't think helps us as creative storytellers. But I do like these definitions to help us make our decisions about what should go where, help us, of like what's best for our story. So I have pretty clear definitions of these sequences, these moments in the story. And because of those definitions, which I find quite effective, you know, it's very clear to me that we're still in Act 2 here. Even though from a minute standpoint, there's only 10 minutes left in the movie. And if there's only 10 minutes left in the movie of a 90-minute film, we should be halfway through Act 3. But we're not. We're still in Act 2 here. Now, why do I think we're still in Act 2? Four primary reasons. The first one is that Nauru is not battling the antagonist yet. She is not going head to head with the antagonist, which is the predator. And that tells me we're probably not in Act 3 right now. Next, her gaining of strength, her getting knocked over and dusting herself off, that is more indicative of sequence 6 within Act 2 of the protagonist gaining strength after a defeat at the midpoint. Now, the third thing is the guardian sacrifice. Her brother sacrifices himself for her, and that usually is always at the end of Act 2 B. And then there's no plan yet. Like, there's no idea of what she's going to do, and that's usually indicative of Act 3, of having this plan and then having this plan now you're launching into Act 3. And so for all of these reasons, because she's still kind of responding, she isn't sure what she's going to do, the Guardian sacrifices, she's just now getting herself revved up to fight. For all these reasons, I believe we're still in Act 2. Now there's a moment which I call the realization. And the realization is when a character realizes who they want to be. 
So for prey, it's when she's behind the rock and she's aiming the gun at the Frenchman and she's going to shoot him from afar and she realizes, nah, man, I got a better idea. I got a better idea of how I'm going to hunt this thing down and I'm going to use this jerk to do just that. And that launches us into Act 3. So I want to take a moment now and kind of look at Act 2. Big thing I learned as I, I started to kind of construct my ideas of structure was what the entire purpose of Act 2 is for. And the entire purpose of Act 2 is to have the character earn the tools, physical tools, emotional tools, and spiritual tools to answer the dramatic question to the audience's satisfaction. Now, we want Naru to win this battle. You know, like we're not going to be satisfied unless she wins, but who Naru is at Act 1 and the tools that she has at her disposal are not equipped to defeat the Predator. She needs Act 2 to acquire those tools, spiritual, emotional, and physical, and then she's capable of defeating the Predator. Now, in many cases, when the transformation is much more stark, it's usually emotional and spiritual tools. For her, though, there's a crisis of confidence, but in the end, she really realizes she is who she thought she was. There's less of a transformation here and more of a buildup of courage and confidence. But those tools, as she's learned how to use the pistol, she knows the Predator's targeting system, she knows where the quicksand is, she now has a, a rope on the hatchet, and the Predator, she realizes, can't see anyone who's using the orange tutsia. And most importantly, she now has that confidence and the courage to face the Predator. And all of these things she acquired over Act 2. Act 3 in this movie is incredibly short. It's 10 minutes. That's like 1950s Act 3. A very old-fashioned Act 3 at 10 minutes long. I'm delighted to see it. I feel like Act 3s are way too long these days. And what really works for me is here is that we don't need more. We don't need it. We don't miss it. I had no idea Act 3 was so short until I broke down the structure. It really works. There's no point in dragging it out. We want to see these two battle it out. They battle out quite effectively. She outsmarts the Predator, and she uses the Predator's technology against it. I think it's really well done, but I think from, a, from an educational perspective, what's unique about it is just how short it is. So in Act 3, Nauru knocks out the Frenchman, uses him as bait. She takes the Totsia so she can't be seen. She has some brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Predator. And then she defeats the Predator, returns to the camp, and becomes the tribe's new war chief. Now, again, I really want to look at these four acts and how unbalanced they are. Act one is 29 minutes, nearly one third of the movie. And act 2A is 15 minutes of the movie. Act 2B is 35 minutes of the movie, more than a third of the movie. And then act three is 10 minutes. Very, very short act three. So. Why is this so successful? Why does this work so well? For me, as a writer, this would drive me crazy. I'm very anal about the balance of my acts, and this is a great reminder to me. It's like, that's an unnecessary thing to worry about. If it is working, if you have narrative momentum and you have emotional resonance, by definition, your script is well-structured. So how do they do it? How do they achieve this? Well, they do it mostly out of sequences. They go from one clear sequence after another clear sequence after another clear sequence after another clear sequence. And because each sequence is driven by a want, narrative momentum is constantly pushed forward. So let's look at it. Act one is a three-part act one. The inciting incident is a little late where she finds the evidence that there is another creature out there. But where it would normally be the inciting incident at minute 10 or so, a new event happens and the lion is out there and one of their tribesmen is now missing. And so now we go into that want of we have to find our fellow tribesmen. 
We find them. Now we have to get him back. It's one want after another. The inciting incident happens. I need to go find my brother. I need to fight the lion. Each sequence is a want. A very clear want drives that sequence. Now we go into Act 2A. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to fight this predator. This is the least narrative-driven act of them all, but it's pretty short, and so it doesn't cost us much. And we use the tension of these two warriors eventually going ahead to move the story along further. And then we talked about Act 2B of four very distinct sequences, each one pushing the story forward. She has to warn her tribesmen. They don't believe her. They're all killed. We then go to the French camp the emotional toll of watching her being poked at and her brother being tortured. And then the French trying to take on the predator and losing and then going back to the French camp. It's one clear sequence after another. And then, like the fastest moving sequence of all, is the act three, which is just 10 minutes long. And you can see these, what is that, 10 sequences? 10 primary sequences through this movie one sequence after another, each one driving the narrative momentum forward. The emotional resonance comes because we care about this character so much. We see, we see her in her everyday life. We like her. We see how she cares about the people, how she cares about her tribe. And of course, we see the resilience in her. And you know, nothing inspires an audience affection for a character more than resilience. And one of the exercises I go through whenever I break down a script is... What are the great scenes? You know, just going back to Howard Hawks' idea of three great scenes, no bad ones, and I follow the philosophy of five great scenes, no bad ones. So what are the great scenes of the movie? Well, the fight with the lion is a good scene. I'm not sure it's a great scene, but it's cool and, you know, tense. The predator versus the wolf scene, the predator fight progressively harder and harder predators than himself. The bear sequence is a great sequence. The predator battling the Frenchman, another great sequence. The return to the French camp and seeing her kill the French, great sequence. And then, of course, the entire 10 minutes of Act 3. It's a great sequence. There is no lack of great scenes and sequences in this movie. Just as important, really, if not more important, but what are the emotional scenes? The emotional scenes of the movie of watching someone, the ones that she loves the most, don't have as much faith in her as she does. That's always tough to watch, very endearing. We have an emotional response to it. Seeing her fail, seeing her get knocked out and have to wake up in the camp, a total failure, is really tough to watch. And then her brother brings home the cat, and that's kind of disappointing, and we have an emotional response to that. Watching her sink in quick stand, not so much an emotional response, but just a lot of tension, really well done sequence. And then watching her own tribesmen beat her up is just grueling and uncomfortable. And we have a very clear emotional response to that. Being trapped by the French, that's a clear emotional response. And then seeing her kind of get the just desserts, get the revenge on the French, that's really emotionally satisfying. Seeing her brother killed, watching her brother transform to going, yes, you are a warrior. And then seeing him killed is a a definite emotional response. The revenge on that one particular French who who tortured her brother. And then seeing her triumph. That's really satisfying. And then we want to see her share that triumph with her family. And she comes home. And that ceremony of bringing the head of the predator. And now she is the new war chief. Great list of emotional moments. Great list of great scenes. Like this, this structure has pretty much anything that you would want in a good structure. It has narrative momentum. It has emotional resonance. It, and you can identify the very clear great scenes and the very clear emotional scenes. So something I've been having fun with and is the question, is Prey a Disney princess movie? And... <laughs> It was basically me realizing and identifying of like, oh, this structure I've seen in some of my favorite Disney movies. And of course, the added joke is that Disney now owns Fox and owns Hulu, which this premiered. So if we kind of look at this structure that the Disney princess movies lean on, 
does prey lean on that same structure itself? So the first question is a family unit that doubts her and wants her to conform to gender roles. That's usually what we see in the Disney movies, and it is also true in Prey. She believes in herself fully, while no one else does. That is also in the Disney movies, and it is also in Prey. She sneaks off to prove herself, like, so like Moana and Mulan. <laughs> yes, that is also true in Prey, and it is also true in the Disney princess movies. She has an animal best friend. Is it a dragon? Is it a fish? Is it a dog? Yes, in Prey, she has an animal best friend, as also the Disney princess movie, she has a best friend. And then she does not change herself as much as she changes those around her. She changes her brother, she changes her mother, she changes the entire village that now make her a war chief. So that is also true in Prey, and it is also true in Disney princess movies. So I think it's brilliant. You take these movies that we love, that we know really work, Ratatouille is actually uses this structure as well. And then you just give it a body count. You throw a predator into it. I mentioned this on Twitter and a lot of people didn't really like the comparison. But again, I find it humorous knowing that Disney now owns Hulu. So I love Prey. I think it's so well done. The structure is really interesting, really confident. These people know what they're doing. And we can learn a lot from it of just how they managed to have such an unbalanced structure and still have such great success with it. Like I wouldn't have the courage to do it. And I'm hoping that you see this and you go, hey, this worked here. If we do it as well, we don't have to be as afraid of it. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot from this breakdown and there'll be more to come. And visit storyandplot.com. I teach courses in structure, I teach courses in log lines and even some free courses on basic screenplay format. And we have a great and growing screenwriting community. So as soon as you enroll in any of the courses, then you have access to the screenwriting community. You can access to me, ask me questions. I'll help out as much as I can. And I hope to see you in the community. All right, thanks so much.